heroes, gods, and monsters of the Greek myths. Book 1, The Gods. Chapter title, Athene. Also, Athene. Also, Athena. Zeus was strolling on Olympus one morning and noticed a new maiden walking in the garden. She was Metis, a Titaness, daughter of one of his old enemies. Um, also, I guess his cousin, because the Titans are like his parents and their generation. Okay, we're just gonna just gonna pass right by that. But the war was long ago, and she was beautiful. He charged down the slope after her. Quite a creep, this Zeus, don't you agree? She turned into a hawk and flew away. He turned into a hawk and flew after her. She flew over the lake and dived in and became a fish. He became a fish and swam after her. She climbed to the bank and became a serpent and wriggled away. He changed himself into the serpent and wriggled after her and caught her. If a person changes their shape three times to avoid you, you should probably just let them be. And the two serpents plaited themselves into beautiful loops. After he left her, he heard a bird cry and the fish leap, and those wild sounds combined to become a prophecy, which the rattling echoes, which the rattling leaves echoed. Oh, Zeus, Metis will bear a child, a girl child, but if she bears again, it will be a son who will depose you as you deposed Kronos. The next day, Zeus walked into his garden again and found Metis there. This time, she did not flee. He spoke softly to her and smiled. She came to him. Suddenly, he opened his mouth and swallowed her. Well, I guess like father, like son, right? I mean, there's no other option here. That afternoon, he suffered a headache. The worst headache that anyone, god or mortal, had suffered since the beginning of time. It was exactly it was exactly as if someone was inside of him with a spear, thrusting it at all the soft spaces in his head. He shouted for Hephaestus, who came rushing up with hammer and wedge. Zeus put his head on the anvil, and Hephaestus split his mighty skull. Then Hephaestus left leapt back, frightened, because out of the head sprang a tall maiden in armor holding a long spear. This was Athena, the gray-eyed, the wide-browed. The manner of her birth gave her domain over intellectual activities. It was she who taught men how to use tools. She taught him to invent the axe, the plow, the ox yoke. That's the thing that um, oxes and uh, cows or bulls they have, over their, um, they have over their shoulders that allows them to pull things. The wheel and the sail. She taught his wife to spin and weave. She concocted the science of numbers and taught it to man. You can blame her for the fact that you have to do math homework. But never to women. Wait, that just seems rude. She hated Ares and took great pleasure in thwarting him on the field of battle. For all of his mighty strength, she often beat him because she was a mistress of strategy. Before battle, captains prayed to her for tactics. Before trial, judges prayed to her for wisdom. It was she who stated that compassion was the best part of wisdom. The other gods didn't know what she meant by this, but some men understood and were grateful. All in all, she is perhaps the best loved god in the pantheon. The people of Athens named their beautiful city after her. There are many stories about Athene, about her skill in battle, her wisdom, and her kindness. But like the other gods, she was also very jealous. One of the best stories, of her jealousy that is, is that of Arachne. Arachne was a young girl who lived in Lydia, famous for its purple dye. Her joy was weaving, and she wove the most beautiful things anyone had ever seen. Cloaks so light you could not feel them about your shoulders, but warmer than fur. Tapestries wrought with pictures so marvelous that birds would fly through windows and try to eat the cherries off of the woven bow. She was a very young girl, and everyone praised her. And Sue, soon she, uh, she began to praise herself. She said, I, I am the greatest weaver in all of the world. 
the greatest since the world began. No doubt. In fact, I can weave better than Athene herself. Y you never want to toss around God's names like this, guys. They, uh, they tend to listen in these stories. And thus, Athene heard this, of course. The gods are very quick to hear, her cr to hear criticism and very swift to act. So she came to Earth, to the little village where Arachne lived. The girl was inside, spinning. She had heard a knock at the door and opened it. There stood a lady so tall, so sternly beautiful, that Arachne knew that she must be a goddess. And she was afraid, because she knew which one. She fell on her knees. Far above her head, she heard a voice speaking softly, saying terrible things. Yes, miserable girl, I am Athene. I am the goddess you have mocked. Is there any reason I should not kill you? Athene shook her head, weeping. She could not answer. Very well. Prepare yourself for death. You have defied the gods and must die. Then Arachne stood up and said, Wait, uh, before I die, great Athene, let me give you a present. She went in and took a lovely cloak she had woven and gave it to her. And she said, T Take this cloak. It must often get cold up high on Olympus. This will shield you from the wind. Please take it. I am sure you have nothing so fine. Athene shook her head and said, <sighs> Poor girl. You are being destroyed by your own worth. Your talent has poisoned you with pride like the sting of a scorpion. So that which makes beauty brings death. But uh, it is a handsome cloak, and I appreciate the gift. I will give you one chance. You have boasted that you can spin and weave better than I. Than I, who invented the loom the distaff and the spindle, and out of fleece of the clouds wove the first counterpane for my father, Zeus, who likes to sleep warm, and dyed it with the colors of the sunset. But you say you can weave better than I. <laughs> Very well. You shall have your chance to prove it. And your own villages shall judge Seven days from today we shall meet. You will set your spindle in the meadow, and I will be in my place, and we shall have a contest. You will weave what you will, and I shall do so too. Then we will show what we have done, and the people will judge. For if you win, I shall withdraw the punishment. If you lose, it is your life. Do you agree? Uh, oh, yes, said Arachne. Thank you, dear goddess, for sparing my life. <laughs> it is not yet spared, said, Ara said Athene. The word flashed from village to village. When the time came, not only Arachne's neighbors, but all the people in the land had gathered in the great meadow to watch the contest. Arachne's house was the last in the village and faced the great meadow. She had set up her loom outside the door. Athene sat in a low, flat hill overlooking the field. Her loom was as large as Arachne's cottage. The girl went first. At the sight of her sitting, spinning there in the sunlight, the crowd pushed in so close she hardly had room to work. Her white hands danced along the flax, and she worked so quickly, so deftly, that she seemed to have forgotten the loom and to be weaving in the air. Swiftly and more swiftly, she tapped the wool with her fingers, making it billow and curl, then rolling it quickly into a ball, then shaking it out again, straining the wool into long, shining threads with quick little pokes of her thumb at the spindle. It was said that her working was as beautiful as her work, and when she was told that, she always smiled and said, It is the same thing. 
So she wove, and the people watched, and the finished cloth began to come from the loom, and everyone laughed to see, for they were joyous scenes, morning scenes, a little boy and a little girl, running in a green field among yellow flowers, chased by a black dog, a maiden at a window dreamingly combing her hair, a young man watching the sea, counting the waves, and later in a purple dusk, the same young man and young girl standing under a tree looking at each other. Hey, that reminds me of that painting that keeps going up on the internet. You've probably seen it. Swiftly... And more swiftly, the white hands danced between loom and spindle. She wove bouquets of flowers for the wedding, and the wedding gown for the bride, and the gorgeous cloak for the young husband. And remembering what Athene had said before, she spun a counterpane for their bed, each square, not a, bl not a block of color, but a little picture, one from the childhood of the man and one from the childhood of the bride, all together mixing as their memories would mix now. The counterpane was last. When she arose and snipped it out, the people gasped and laughed and wept with joy, and the Arachne curtsied towards the low hill, and the theme began to spin. I do want to point out, this is like a little girl fighting a god at, like, weaving slash, like, making something. Uh, the, the poor girl doesn't really stand a chance, but, like, she's... She did something really gorgeous and beautiful, and that's something to be remembered. In stories like these, it's almost always something to remember. The goddess had conjured up a flock of plump, white, woolly clouds above her hilltop. So she did not have to, so she did not have to comb fleece or draw thread. She used cloud wool, the finest stuff in all the world. And she dyed it with the colors of dawn and the colors of sunset and the colors of sleep and the colors of storm. Now the whole western part of the sky was her loom. She had flung great tapestries across the horizon, scenes from Olympus, things that mortal man had never hoped to see, almost too terrible to see. Kronos sitting upon Aronos. Yeah, I know, that's a different name. That doesn't make much sense. It's the same name as, Uran as Uranus from before. It's just that now, for some odd reason, Uranos is the name. This will keep happening in this book. Uh, the author keeps just kind of like meshing together tales, and there's a bunch of misspellings that happen. Or maybe not misspellings, but like changes. Um, so let me restate that. Cronus cutting up Uran Uranus with a scythe. Zeus, charging across the firmament with his hundred-handed ones, shattering the titans. The binding of Zeus, by the way, shattering the titans? So they just blew up? It's only like three chapters later. See, the author just told us that there wasn't going to be an explanation of what happened to them, and now all of a sudden you're just telling me that they blew up. That's like a whole thing. The binding of Zeus. The punishment of Hera. Zeus chasing Metis as a hawk and fish and snake, then the birth of Athene herself, springing from Zeus's broken head. Then more quiet scenes. Athene teaching the arts to man, teaching him to plow, to sail, to ride into chariots, teaching the women to spin, then finally muddling it all together, poking her lawn spittle across the woven clouds and mixing them and stirring them into a dark, strange picture. The future of man. Man growing huge and monstrous, his trees turning to spikes, his fields to stone, swollen and dropsical with pride, bringing something so, loath so loathsome he had to look away when he was making it. This was too much for the multitude. The vast crowd fell on its knees and wept. Arachne was watching. She had never moved from the time Athene had started to work, but stood there, straight with pale face and glittering eyes, watching. And when the people fell on their knees, she turned and went away, 
She walked quietly to a grove of trees and there took a rope and hanged herself. Also, with these stories, uh, suicide tends to be just like a thing that happens. So uh, if you're not prepared for characters that you like to just die, uh, the, the, the versions of the myths that we're hearing here are much more Game of Thrones than, uh, than Harry Potter. So just so you're aware, that's going to keep happening. Athene came down from the hill and spoke no words to the people, who dispersed. Then she went to the grove and saw Arachne hanging there. The girl's face was black, her eyes were bulging, her hair was streaming. She kind of looks like, uh, who's the girl from The Ring? Samara? Samara? That one. Athene reached her long arm and touched the girl on the shoulder. The face grew blacker, and the eyes bulged more. The body shrank, and the arms and legs dwindled and multiplied. Then Athene touched the rope. It shriveled, growing thinner and thinner, until it was a frail, shining strand. And there, at the end of this shining silken hair, swung a small, hairy creature with many legs. It looked at Athene, then turned and scuttled up its thread, drawing it up as it climbed. It floated away over the grass until it became to a low bush, cast another loop, and sat there practicing, for it knew that now it was meant to spin without rivalry until the end of time. That is why spiders are called arachnids by those who know them best. Uh, I will also point out here that this is a moment where Athena feels bad about the fact that she decisively just um, schooled a little girl so bad that she died. Uh, if you go back and reread this story, which I suggest you do, you will notice, as most will, that she decided to take out all of her powers and use all of her powers to make an entire mountain side, uh, the entire horizon turn into visions to beat this girl at weaving. Um... With that mindset, I mean, like, that would be like if you put on a movie at, like, a, at your house, and then one of your friends was like, oh, man, you should come over from my place, and they had a full, like, IMAX screen, or, like, that weird giant one in Liberty Science Center, that would be the difference. So I want you to think about that. These gods are going to act like this more often than you'd imagine. They're quite... Um, vindictive is the best word. Uh, if you cross them, they will hurt you. And they also get really easily jealous for people who are supposed to be like, you know, gods. Kind of makes you think. That was a theme.